Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me for this talk about the Family Museum. Um, I want to start by thanking Art UK and Bloomberg Philanthropies for giving us this opportunity and also to all of you who donated. Thank you so much um, on behalf of Art UK and the Foundling, because as an independent museum, your support means a very great deal. So for those of you who don't know and have never visited, this is the Foundling. Um, we are situated in London, in Bloomsbury, about equidistant between King's Cross and uh, the British Museum. And really, we tell the story of a very special part of London. There's a real sense of place to the story that we tell about the kind of creative action, uh, the transforming of lives that have, has occurred in this small corner of London for over 250 years. Um, and also particularly a story about what I like to describe as the agency of the artist, what it is that artists and creative people can do in society, how they can galvanise society in a way that other people, particularly politicians, can't. So this, our site, our building, 40 Brunswick Square, is on the site of the former Foundling Hospital, which was established by Royal Charter in 1739 and was set up as the UK's first children's charity. And its mission was to take in babies who would otherwise have been abandoned on the streets of London, to care for them, to educate them, to train them in trades, and then to set them loose in the world as useful citizens, boys and girls. What you can see here is the Foundling Hospital in 1926 because the hospital was on that site from the 1740s to 1926, when it then relocated outside London to new premises, because what had been 50 acres of open pasture land had become built up and smoggy, and the governors felt it wasn't really suitable for the children. But what you can see is the boys filing out of the hospital for the last time. Behind them is the chapel, which we'll come back to later. To the right is the girls' wing, and out of the picture, but opposite it, was an identically framed boys wing, so very symmetrical, and it had been designed deliberately like that so that the small children when they arrived didn't get confused. When the building was sold and torn down in 1926, a lot of the 18th century fabric was kept, it was salvaged, and our building, 14 Brunswick Square, which was built in the 1930s to be the charity's London headquarters, has built into it a lot of the original fabric, this 18th century fabric. So on the front of the building, you can see the roundels and the masonry and the pillars, even down to the um, drain, drain pipe that you can see on the left, which has the little foundling lamb on it. This is all original 18th century fabric. And inside the museum, we have a lot of the original historic interiors. And so everything from the staircase that runs all the way through the building, this beautiful oak staircase, which was the staircase from the boys' wing, to um, uh, mouldings and clocks and furniture and entire rooms like this beautiful courtroom, which is one of the finest Rococo interiors in London. Um, but when you look at a space like the courtroom, the thing that probably strikes you in terms of it being a children's charity is the extraordinary art upon the wall. And that art, that combination of art and childcare is what makes the Foundling Hospital story and the Foundling Museum so extraordinary and unique is a very overused word but it genuinely is. There is no museum in the world like ours and we're very proud of it and when we think about why this combination of childcare and art the location comes into play again because when the Foundling Hospital was first set up and was being built in the 1740s the site that was chosen for it was deliberately outside London so you can see it in the top left hand corner that was done to keep the children away from the disease of London. Um, but of course that formed a problem because the Foundling Hospital relied on individual donations from you know, wealthy and comfortably off people who didn't live anywhere near the Foundling Hospital. And obviously the roads were bumpy and uncomfortable. There were foot pads loose um, in, the, in the environs. And so there had to be a really good reason to get people out to the hospital. And they were from the very beginning detractors who felt that the Foundling Hospital would be encouraging, you know, sexual promiscuity and rewarding sexual license. And so the Foundling Hospital had a job on its hands to convince people that the work it was doing was really worthwhile. So they needed people to come. But the problem was, how did you do this? So the 18th century was an amazing combination. It was an age of pleasure. But it was also, in the words of William Hogarth, the great British artist, it was a golden age of philanthropy. And this combination of 
pleasure and philanthropy um, uh, can be, I think, summed up best in the greatest work in our collection, which is the first work I wish to speak about, which is this. This is William Hogarth's full length portrait, uh, life size of uh, the Foundling Hospital's founder, Thomas Coram. Now he's called Captain Thomas Coram. He wasn't a captain, he was a shipbuilder by trade. Sent to sea at 11, a uh, very limited education, who as a young man set up the first uh, shipyard outside Boston in America. When he returned to London in the 1720s, he was horrified by the sight of children destitute and dying babies um, in London and decided to do something about it. And I think he, it, his campaign to get, get the royal assent to start a founding hospital took him 17 and a half years. And we have no idea when in this 17 and a half year journey, when or how or why his path crossed with that of the artist William Hogarth. But it was a lightning strike of good fortune that it did, because William Hogarth would come up, go on to be not only a really steadfast and multifaceted supporter of the hospital, but he really uh, galvanised society. He, like he did with Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, found that secret ingredient, um, the win-win, to make it work for the charity and work for himself as an artist. And I think both Coram and Hogarth had an awful lot of similarities. They were both of them in their different ways, galvanizers of people, getting people to do something to kind of get involved. They were both incredibly entrepreneurial in terms of the way that they went about tackling the problems they had in hand and, and ways of thinking around outside the box and kind of around the box as to how you could do it. They were visionary. They, they saw a future that was different, that they felt they could build and make in the face of all sorts of obstacles. And they were ambitious and they were incredibly determined and they didn't say no for, take no for an answer. And they were both men who called a spade a spade. I think Hogarth did it a bit more wittily <laughs> than Gorham, but their plain speaking uh, would get them both in troubles at various times. Um, and so in this painting, you get this bringing together of childcare and art. So, Hogarth um, had an amazing start in life, which I think gave him skin in the game. When he was a child, he spent five years of his life with his whole family in the Fleet Prison because his father was in prison for debt. So he knew firsthand that bad things happened to good people and that for families who got into financial trouble, there was absolutely no safety net for them at all. And this is why Hogarth was trained to be an engraver, because he couldn't, he needed to get to work, he needed a job. Um, so he, he, in a sense, was, was philosophically sort of open to what Coram was trying to do. And it's also interesting, if you look at Hogarth's work, particularly his prints, how often he will use children and babies as a kind of canary to signal the moral health of, of the nation and the society and the folly of adults and particularly kind of government in terms of the... the, the um, the uh, the things that it would kind of the terrible things that would rain down on the heads of, of, of younger generations. So at the time that Coram was campaigning to establish his foundling hospital, Hogarth was running the only art school in London. He'd inherited it from his father, a father-in-law, um, and he was sort of fighting a rearguard action to establish a school of British art that when Henry VIII broke from Rome with the Reformation, really the visual arts took a huge knock in this country. And, you know, the great British artists um, from then on, from Holbein, Van Dyck, Rubens, Neller, um, they were foreign imports effectively. And come the middle of the 18th century, Hogarth was determined that British art, that there should be a British art school, that the received wisdom that great art was Italian or French, that the Millards going on their grand tours and bringing back their canalettos and their souvenirs of ancient Rome, that this wasn't good enough, that, that British homegrown talent was as good as anything that the continent could produce. But where to display contemporary art, where to show the polite classes what these artists could do. Meanwhile, his friend was building this big building outside London, he wanted to attract precisely the same audience and he had all this empty wall space. And so in donating this work to the founding hospital, uh, Hogarth also encouraged, again, galvanized all of his friends and colleagues and peers, many of whom were working with him at the St. Martin's Lane Academy to do the same. 
And within a few years, the Foundling Hospital would become one of the most fashionable places in London for the kind of uh, uh, sort of um, intellectual and society classes to, to go. And of course, once they were at the hospital, they could see the good work that the charity was doing and their heartstrings would be plucked and they would be encouraged to give money and to support. Um, but they were also there surrounded by the best that Reynolds and Hudson and Ramsey and Hogarth and Highmore and the rest of them could do. And so we'd go, well, you know, my darling, why did not we get Mr. Reynolds to paint your portraits? So it was a win-win situation. But the way that it was done, in a sense, on the artist's own terms is, I think, summed up very much in the way that Hogarth has approached this painting of his friend. So he's used all of the trappings and traditions of Baroque portraiture to present Thomas Coram in the ways that you would assume a man of sort of aristocratic or royal birth would be presented with the fabulous kind of classical architecture, the attributes of his trade and his knowledge, the royal charter that he's holding. But he presents his friend as he is, that he has not wearing a wig, which is very unusual. His face is very weather beaten, his gnarly hands. Coram was not very tall, so you see his little legs kind of not quite touching the ground. So that idea of greatness, much like his campaign for British art, just because something's Italian or French doesn't make it good. Same thing here. Just because this man is of humble birth and is not very wealthy and is not well educated does not make him great. I mean, does not not make him great. He is a great man. He is a great man by dint of what he has done and what he's achieved and his moral compass. And for that, he gets this great Baroque treatment. So I mentioned that Coram had this huge challenge, this 17 year campaign, the fact that in the 18th century, if you want to establish a charity, you need the king's permission. And the way to do that was to get the support of powerful men. And Coram spent the first 10 years of his campaign trying to get a single man of influence to uh, sign his petition. And after a decade, not one man had. So Coram, the entrepreneur too, turned his attention to the women. And the next picture I want to look at is a beautiful portrait by Andrea Soldi that we were quite recently able to acquire. This is one of the 21 ladies of quality and distinction, the group of women who Coram turned to to get their signatures on the petition, headed up by Charlotte, Duchess of Somerset, who was in her early 20s, married to the richest man in England. She was the first to sign and Isabella was the fourth. And in 1735, their petition went to George II. Although the ladies didn't succeed, they got the ball rolling. And a few years later, when the gentleman's petition went in, it's not a surprise to see that most of their fathers and brothers and husbands were on that petition. Of course, because it was the gentleman's petition that was successful, the Royal Charter, which we also have on display in the museum, only has the men's name on it. So in 2018, uh, which was the centenary of female suffrage, we uh, decided to spend the entire year focusing our programming on the role that women had played in the story and the history and the kind of um, uh, project of the family hospital. And the climax of this was at the end of the year where we unhung all of the portraits of our male governors, fabulous as they are, that had been on the walls for at least a century. Um, and having spent two years tracking them down, we put the 21 ladies up on the wall in their place with Coram in the, the centre. They looked resplendent and as a result we were able to acquire Isabella, which means that forever now the women and their catalytic role is up there on the wall. And I think what I love about the women is rather like the artists, that power and influence are two different things. And artists, rather like these aristocratic ladies, in theory don't have power, but they have a hell of a lot of influence. And if it's wielded well, things can happen that really affect change for good. So coming back to Hogarth's portrait, um, as I said, this is life size. And uh, when you're standing in front of it, just about at eye level, so at Thomas Coram's feet, you see that Hogarth has painted very boldly in very clear letters, painted and given by William Hogarth. And this plain speaking of Hogarth uh, was contagious. He also, his first creative act was for the Family Hospital was to come up with its coat of arms, which has a single word motto that is in English, not Latin. And that single word is help. So very to the point. But this sense of we will, if we, if we can't, sort of give you, we will give you pleasure and fun and, you know, art, but we will also guilt you into supporting this charity because if we, the skint artists, can help and support, then you jolly well should too. And the sense of it being a kind of a team effort is really encapsulated in the courtroom because if you stood in this courtroom in the 1760s, you were standing in the centre of 
the contemporary British art world, which was as international then as it was now. So in this room, uh, you have, and sort of, I, I will go around, you have the four main history paintings, which use biblical metaphor to tell the sort of the first five years of a foundling child's life at the family hospital. History paintings very deliberately, because history painting was the highest genre of art and was the genre that British artists were believed to be least capable of delivering. And we think that this overall design of this room was Hogarth's. Um, so this is all obviously uh, illustrations of charity and a reinforcement of the fact that uh, the Foundling Hospital's um, project had kind of, you know, uh, solid foundations, particularly in the figure of Moses. Then between them, you have the roundels and the roundels all illustrate uh, hospitals in London and hospital meant both medical hospital or it could be a charity like the Foundling Hospital. So going from left to right, we have St Thomas's Hospital, St George's, which had just been completed, the Foundling Hospital in the corner, Chelsea Hospital, which is obviously just off the King's Road. Um, then we have uh, the Charter House painted by a 21 year old Thomas Gainsborough, who had just come up from Suffolk. Then we have uh, Christ Hospital, Bethlehem or Bedlam and Greenwich Hospital. Then you have the glorious uh, um, stucco ceiling and all the plaster work, which was donated by William Wilton. Uh, the King's Master Mason, Deval, gave the fireplace and the fire surround. Risebrack gave the beautiful um, uh, relief over the fireplace. And on the opposite side, of the fire, uh, the opposite side of the fireplace, which you can't see, is a wonderful pier table and mirror by Sanderson. And Sanderson and Deval and Risebrack all carve into their works, uh, you know, gift of John Sanderson fake it at Dunavit, I made it, I gave it. So if you were a wealthy Malad being entertained in this room, you were basically being pummeled from all sides with this thing about, you know, you are here for a reason and the reason is to be charitable and not after your death with somebody doing some Hail Marys, but right now in your lifetime, muscular charity, do good. And as our, one of our wonderful fellows, Johnny Banger says, you've got to uh, start where you are, use what you can, uh, use what you've got, do what you can. And that's really what these artists, masons, carpenters, architects, painters, sculptors were demonstrating that everybody had something that they could give to help this charity get off the ground. And if the creatives could do it, then the uh, aristocrats certainly could too. So this, this galvanizing spirit um, is something that we harness and work with in the contemporary artists that we um, continue working with today. Because as I said, this is a story about living artists and what they can do. And so one of the things we do is we have this wonderful biennial fellowship um, and our fellows include Cornelia Parker. And for her fellowship project, she turned again to the galvanizing nature of artists. And much like Hogarth drummed all his Martin Slane Academy uh, members into helping, um, uh, Cornelia got 63 artists, all her friends, most of whom were Royal Academicians. And what's interesting is that all the artists in the 18th century who donated work to the Foundling Hospital as a way of thanks were made artist governors. And this, this pool of kind of peers and colleagues and uh, sometimes rivals who would come together every year to think about what could they do next for the Foundling Hospital. It, that was the seedbed for the forming of the Royal Academy, which came on stream 18, 20 years later. So Cornelia returning to this idea. So most of the 63 artists were Royal Academicians who between them uh, contributed 99 objects that we showed throughout the museum. Here you have Gavin Turk's remarkable painted um, uh, um, uh, uh, bronze sculpture of a homeless person in a sleeping bag. So really referencing that sense that in the same way that people were able to walk past babies left on rubbish heaps in the 18th century, we too walk past homeless people and we don't stop to kind of go, actually, do you know what? <laughs> this is shocking and, and I should really try and do something about this. And similarly, Anthony Gormley with his wonderful iron baby modeled on his few weeks old daughter, Paloma, um, which was in an entirely empty gallery, just the baby on the floor. Um, and they were hugely resonant. Again, Cornelia looking again to that history of the hospital, like a number of the artists we work with, making beautiful limited edition prints. This is called A Little Drop of Gin. Um, sadly, it's sold out now, but we kept one for the collection. Um, so the sale of these prints uh, to raise money to support the learning programmes that we do with very disadvantaged children. Another work that was shown as part of Found, which we were able to acquire, was this wonderful piece called Trumpet Boy, which is by another one of our fellows, Yinka Shonabari. And another way that we use contemporary art in the collection is to surface aspects of our story 
which are perhaps more hidden or are a kind of absent presence. And with Yinka's piece, on a very simple level, it surfaces children, because although our story have, has children at its heart, the collection actually is predominantly uh, sort of adult friendly or you know, portraits of adults. So to have visitors welcomed by this triumphant uh, music playing uh, boy is wonderful. And again, another thing is surfacing music, which is a key part of our story, and I'll come to in a minute but also being able to surface the fact that the Foundling Hospital really set itself up as a sort of, in a sense, um, to support the, the, the project of empire, expanding empire, and the idea that the founding children could become useful citizens and, and in a sense, engines of empire. And Yinka in his work, which really references ideas of na nationhood and identity and empire and, um, the, the, the sharing of, of cultures really through his use of what are seen as African fabrics, but are in fact Dutch fabrics modeled on Indonesian fabrics that were then sold to, uh, um, to Africa. He's really plays with these ideas. And then finally, Trumpet Boy came from a series of Yinkas that was looking at the enlightenment and the idea of education as something that could both improve the individual and improve society, which of course, again, was very much a founding hospital project. So this is a wonderful work for us and uh, is such a joyous but complex and uh, thoughtful piece to, to animate as I said, those aspects of our collection that aren't so obvious. So it wasn't just the visual artists. And, you know, the great third leg in our historic stool is the composer George Frederick Handel. And he came on board some years after the visual artists, but having uh, written the anthem for the founding hospital and donated the organ for the chapel, he would go on to every year until his death, conduct a benefit concert of Messiah. And this raised a really substantial amount of money for the hospital. But in his will, which you can also see on display in the museum, his final codicil, which was written some just a few weeks before his death, he leaves the fair copy, the kind of conducting score, and the 28 parts of Messiah to the Foundling Hospital, which was immensely generous. This is over a thousand pages of handwritten music, which the governors of the Foundling Hospital could never have afforded or justified the expense of buying. But Handel knew that in doing that, he would enable the Foundling Hospital to carry on doing benefit concerts after his death, which indeed they did. So this association between the Foundling Hospital and the Messiah is really one of the reasons why at any given day, somewhere in the world, somebody is doing a benefit concert of Messiah to raise money for some good cause. Um, and also Handel as well, much like Hogarth, was able to use the Foundling Hospital as the perfect environment, the perfect performance space for his sacred oratorio, which couldn't really be performed in theatres because theatres were a bit too disreputable and he had had a kind of venue issue when he first Premier Messiah. So like the artists, there was a win-win here, but it was fantastic for the, for the Handling Hospital. And it wasn't just the composers. You have John Beard. Um, John Beard was Handel's favourite tenor. Handel uh, wrote a number of his tenor roles for Beard, who premiered them. He was the, uh, he did the London premiere of Messiah, but he also importantly donated his services as singer um, for these annual benefit concerts for the hospital. Um, and uh, he's also an interesting character in his own right. He married the daughter of John Rich, who built Covent Garden Theatre, and after Rich's death, uh, he ran uh, the theatre with his mother-in-law and his wife, Priscilla, and he was responsible for really establishing Covent Garden as an opera house. So Beard is there too. So in the museum, in addition to the Handel Gallery, there you can see Beard at the top of the stairs next door uh, to uh, uh, um, Handel's Amanuensis and Jennings, the librettist. What you can't see in this picture is Chris Watson's fabulous sound piece, which floods the boys' staircase that goes top to bottom of the museum. And this is a beautiful piece called Dawn Chorus. And he made it for us with young adults who'd grown up in children's homes in London. And Chris explained, Chris is a legendary natural history sound recordist, and he told us that all of the birds that sing in the area, both migratory and domestic, were all genetically descended from the birds that would have sung for the foundlings in the 18th, 19th and 20th century. So they went out 
the weekend of International Dawn Chorus Day, which is the first Sunday in May. And they laid the specialist sound recording equipment on the footprint of the Foundling Hospital and recorded the Dawn Chorus when it started at 16 minutes past three in the morning and edited it down. So as a visitor, when you climb the stairs and you hear the creaks that the boys would have heard over the centuries inside the hospital, you're also listening to the descendants of the birds that sang for the children outside the hospital. Finally, we have text. And text is extraordinary in the museum. Uh, there is text everywhere. There is nearly a thousand linear feet of archive belonging to the Foundling Hospital, and most of it is administrative documentation. But in this documentation, like these admission billets from the 18th century, so you can see this one for child of 1,780, admitted on the 25th of June, 1756. But this information that a lot of these billets come in with notes or letters or heartbreaking poems in some instances. And in this text, you have this incredible space between history and imagination and between the individual and the every person, the every child, the every mother, the personal and the universal. And this space, this imaginary space that all of this documentation produces is a really rich source of inspiration for a lot of the artists that we work with, these hidden lives buried and hinted at in the, in the administration. So Cornelia Parker with Found, another of our fellows, Grayson Perry, his projects, uh, we have a beautiful painting inspired by the physical tokens, which are here by Michael Craig Martin that we commissioned from him, Claire Toomey, Jodie Carey, wonderful and Michael Paul Pergo have all um, as fellows and artists responded to this incredibly rich imaginative space and these are physical tokens which are the small objects that mothers left with the admission records of their babies to enable them should they ever come back be able to come back to, to identify their child. If you look at the bottom row second in from the left it's the elliptical this is a token which we commissioned a wonderful work from David Shrigley, the artist, and this was the token that he chose to create this very moving work for us, which he subsequently donated to the museum. So text has a, a huge role to play, and the precedent again is set back in the past in, in some of the earlier supporters, most particularly Charles Dickens. And interestingly, he supported both in terms of fact and in terms of imagination. So this is his article, Received a Blank Child, about the Founding Hospital that he wrote with his journalist hat on for Household Words. But he would also write about the Founding Hospital in characters like Tatty Corum and Little Dorrit. And other writers have continued this tradition, most notably another of our fellows, one of our very first fellows, wonderful Jacqueline Wilson, who wrote for her fellowship project what was then her first historical novel, which is the children's novel Hetty Feather. And Hetty is a fictional 19th century founding girl who grows up at the founding hospital. And Hetty is now a series of five books, several CBBC series, uh, a, a fabulous stage show, sold over 35 million copies, and much like Hogarth, Jacqueline drives hundreds of families a year to come and see where Hetty lives. But this beautiful portrait of her that we commissioned as part of this programme of work we did in, the, in 2018, it has a beautiful story behind it too. So the person who enabled us to, to realise this commission was Dame Stephanie Shirley, who came over as part of the kinder transport escaping the Nazis as a child. And the artist who painted this was Saeed Dai, who was sent over again unaccompanied from Iran as a six-year-old child, and his parents never followed, and he was grown up in the, grew up in the care of others and other schools. And Jacqueline, too, who speaks about the loneliness of her childhood and how creative writing kind of gave her that, out, that, that source of joy. And so within this one painting, you have, again, these other stories. So these multiple stories that are contained within every aspect. And here on display in the museum for our younger visitors is page one, chapter one of the very first Teddy Feather, which is, a, is an absolute uh, uh, yeah, wonderful object for them. And so finally, you have, in a sense, our, another of our fellows, he's also now a trustee, Lem Sisse, and this is a detail of his fabulous mural, Superman was a foundling, that really, I think, nails it in terms of talking about this, this extraordinary role of culture to shine a light on what's in front of our noses all the time. And in Lem's case, this idea of 
the role that looked after children play, the, their importance, their power in culture right around the world in stark contrast to the, their marginalization and silence and the lack of care that they are given in reality. And Lem grew up in children's homes and he says if anybody had taken the time to read him a bedtime story and point out that Superman was a foundling and that James Bond was orphaned and that Han Solo was, was an orphan, that it would have meant so much to him. So this, the latest of our wonderful creative gifts is um, a gift from Sir Quentin Blake, who's been a longtime supporter of ours and is one of our fellows, a gift of 24 large scale drawings. Um, and we have commissioned seven poets, including the poet Jackie Kay, who has responded to this particular work with a beautiful poem called My Mother is a Robin. Um, and these are on display at the museum at the moment. But this creative narrative kind of continues. And from the, oops, from the autumn of this year, autumn of 21, the staircase will be hung differently. We are in the middle of a commission, commissioning five wonderful artists, including Wolfgang Tillmans, to make five portraits of five former pupils of the Vermelin Hospital, who are now very elderly. They're in their late 80s and early 90s. They are the last generation who grew up at the Foundling Hospital in the 1950s. And of the 25,000 children who went through the Foundling Hospital from 1741 to 1954, until now we have not one single portrait of one of those children. So in that space that I mentioned between history and imagination, all of those absences, those absent presences that we have in the building, that we will finally have five portraits that will actually be able to represent and speak to the remarkable lives and the resilience um, and yes the, the truly extraordinary people that these children were um, and the system that they went through and grew up in and this ongoing story that we that we tell that we animate um, so yes the family museum I think when I think about it it is a it's a house of stories, you know, over 25,000 of these stories. It's a home of creative action. You know, we as a museum exist to transform lives through creative action, particularly the lives of young people at the margins. But I like to think transforming the lives of everyone who gets involved in whatever way. The museum is a source of inspiration for every visitor who comes, as well as all the creative people that we work with. And above anything it's a lightning rod for artists it's it's an amazingly humming place for them where they really um it's a kind of spiritual home for for those artists who want to get involved and for their work to actually affect change so i want to end there and i want to thank you all for for listening um i want to thank art uk for giving us this opportunity and thank you again bluebird philanthropies um it's been wonderful thank you so much